Hello and welcome to another in the Jewish History Lab series. Today's class begins with a rhetorical question. How did the Jewish people survive antiquity? I say rhetorical because don't get excited. I really don't think I'm going to give you a complete answer by the end of this class. My goal is to try and recap the uh, period of antiquity, which we have spent the last 15 odd weeks looking at in detail, and kind of provide a, uh, a moment to breathe, to step back, to reflect on what we've covered, uh, because it's going to change dramatically in the next 15 week semester when we go into the medieval period. So, again, I'm not going to really answer how did the Jewish people survive antiquity. I certainly have a few thoughts on this, and I'll share some of them in the next video. But for the time being, consider this just a moment to reflect on what we've covered and to take a deep breath and then we're going to go into the next adventure which is the medieval period. So here's a beautiful photograph from Samarkand. It's actually an antique photograph from the beginning of the 20th century and it has been colorized uh, so it's gorgeous. You really get a sense of like yeah life in history was actually in color not in black and white. We're so used to these photographs. Let's, uh, let's begin with the quick recap. So Here's our map of the Middle East. You can see I put a little marker for where Jerusalem is in the land of Israel. And we start with Abraham and Sarah's migration from the land of Ur, from that would be ancient Sumeria. And most historians place this somewhere around the year 1750 before the Common Era. The challenge of working with this data, of course, is that almost everything is derived from one source, the Hebrew scriptures, Tanakh, presents a whole range of challenges, which we discussed way back at the beginning of the semester. Uh, look at the video on approaching the Bible as a historical source for some of the difficulties. At any rate, according to the narrative that we have in the biblical text, Abraham and Sarah make their way from Mesopotamia to the land of Israel. And then there's some interesting kind of side trips to Egypt that occur not only with Abraham and his descendants, but most significantly with Joseph, who ends up, you know, the amazing story becomes the vizier of, uh, of Egypt, and then his family follows them because of famine, and the Jews end up being enslaved there for several hundred years. Note, by the way, I'm using the term Jew here. Uh, anachronistically, they would not have called themselves Jews at that time. Uh, most likely, they would have called themselves maybe Ivrim or Hebrews, uh, which comes from Ever Hanahar, from the other side of the river, meaning they originate from the other side of the river Euphrates. I have a video on the evolution of various terms, um, such as Hebrew, Israelite, uh, Judean, Jewish, and so on. And I tend to sort of elide them all and call everybody Jewish. Sorry if that irritates you, but away we go. The next big event, of course, in the Bible is the Exodus, which occurs sometime around the year 1300 before the Common Era, uh, resulting in a settlement of Jews in the land of Israel. And this is where we begin to slowly get more and more archaeological evidence, such as the Merneptah Stele, which refers to Jews in Israel, or that is, refers to Israel in this region at about this time. When you move forward from the Torah itself, the first five books of Moses, into the uh, early prophets, we see in the period of Judges, there's discussion of kind of like a, a tribal organization of governance in the land of Israel. And then that culminates and described in the book of, uh, of Samuel in the appointment of Saul as the first king of what would become a united monarchy. Uh, this is the golden age, followed by David and Solomon, where you have really the, the period when and the, the, the nascent experiment in Jewish sovereignty in this land uh, expands significantly, both in terms of territory, in terms of influence, and so on. Unfortunately, after Solomon, it descends into civil war, and the region is divided. The northern region is called Israel, and the southern region is called Judah, as shown in this map. Then if we move forward a few centuries, we get to the Assyrian invasion, when Israel, the northern kingdom, is attacked, and a good portion of its population is shipped off in a population transfer, which is something common in the 8th century. This is the origin of the 10 lost tribes, which is a little bit of a misnomer because lots of people were left behind in the region. Many of them migrated south and blended with the population of Judah as well, but nevertheless a significant population was taken off 
into the north. There is then another invasion which reaches the southern kingdom of Judah and uh, destroys the temple that was built there in Jerusalem and exiles once again a significant portion of the population, especially the elites, off to Babylonia. This occurred in the early 6th century. This exile, however, is fairly short-lived because a few decades later, Cyrus, uh, leader of the Persian Empire, grants religious freedom to the Jews and many other peoples in his kingdom, and the Jews return to the land of Israel and reestablish the temple there. Uh, this refers to the, the second commonwealth, that is the, the, the second resurgence of some level of Jewish sovereignty in the land of Israel. It's not a complete sovereignty. They're still really part of the Persian Empire, but nevertheless, Jews are in their land and governing themselves. Uh, when the Greeks come in in the 4th century, uh, the Jews are overwhelmed by them and overwhelmed more significantly by Greek culture, Hellenism, and this sparks a dramatic revolution in the year 165 uh, called the Hanukkah Rebellion when the Jews throw off the uh, dominance, the political dominance, and ultimately the spiritual cultural dominance of the Greek Empire that was then based in uh, in Syria, the Seleucids, and they um, re-establish a Jewish kingdom under the Maccabees, also known as the Hasmoneans or Hashmonaim in Hebrew. Uh, the Greek culture, however, keeps uh, exerting its influence, and even though the Jews have established some sovereignty, they are not free from the cultural influence of Hellenism, and they ultimately will continue along that path. Romans invade in the year 63, not a really good word to use. I should have changed that because they don't exactly invade. They're kind of invited in because of dispute between the Maccabean kings, but with the Roman advance into Israel, then you have the gradual and sporadic limitation of Jewish rule. Basically, what the Romans do is they allow the, the Jews, like they did with many other peoples they conquered, to have a level of self-government and the power of the kingdoms in now what is called Judea vary depending on how adept the Jewish king was at negotiating the corridors of Roman power. Herod, for example, is one of the most powerful Jewish kings. He happened to be very successful at this, and uh, he had a very long rule in the first century BCE, a uh, tremendous amount of uh, public works and building and so on, but at the same time, he was an incredible tyrant, murdered much of his own family, and so on. The Jews will rebel in the first century of the Common Era, uh, a major rebellion that goes badly for them, and the Second Temple is destroyed in the year 70. Although we refer to the Roman exile from the year 70, again, it's a little bit of a misnomer. A significant number of Jews were taken off into slavery and so on, but by no means was the region depopulated. Uh, there was, however, a second rebellion under Bar Kokhba about 70-odd years later, and this resulted in a much more devastating uh, Roman reaction, and the central region of Judea itself, as opposed to the coastal region and the Galilee, uh, was more significantly depopulated than before. So that's basically the period that we're going to use to describe antiquity. Uh, note, however, that this is not necessarily the same term that secular scholars use for Western civilization. They tend to stretch the period of antiquity out until the 400s with the fall of Rome. Um, but at, this is when we start to see really major changes happening in the Jewish population. So let us just recall the tremendous challenges that these developments imposed on the Jewish people. Um, first of all, the loss of sovereignty, right? I mean, that's something that can basically knock out just about any people. The, the fact that they lost the control of their land multiple times. Uh, first under the Assyrians when the ten northern tribes uh, were taken away, then under the Babylonians when Judah was destroyed, uh, then under the Greeks when their level of self-rule under the Persians was threatened, and uh, then uh, under the Romans, of course. This is like repeated loss of sovereignty. The Jews keep coming back, nevertheless, and reestablishing some level of self-rule. If we jump ahead to the 20th century, they'll do it again after 2,000 years of absence, which is really mind-boggling. Secondly, 
not only loss of sovereignty, but physical displacement, right? It's hard enough for a country to reassert its national identity uh, when they lose control of their self-government. But imagine if much of the population, especially the elites, especially the uh, uh, males of fighting age, are taken off to a far-off location, you know, if they're not living within the contiguous borders of one territory, how do they reestablish themselves, especially in the ancient period when communication and transportation is nothing like what we would see in the modern era? A third, a full on court press of other powerful dominant cultures the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Persians, oh my gosh, the Greeks. Incredible differences in the way that these people saw the world around them, you know, and the idea that that Jews could somehow maintain their cultural independence with a highly distinct form of worship and ethics and literature, you know, these are tremendous stresses placed on the Jewish people uh, during the period of antiquity. Uh, repeated defeats in war, tremendously devastating to and discouragement to see you're like standing up and getting knocked down again and again and again. The Bar Kokhba revolt, the, uh, the first Roman Jewish war, the Quitos rebellion, over and over again, the Jews are not succeeding with the exception of the Maccabean revolt. Uh, they are simply not doing well for the last two, three hundred years of their existence in the period of antiquity. And finally, it, it, we certainly cannot discount the spiritual crisis that must have ensued when so much of what they considered rock solid was not so, such as, for example, the, uh, the, the temple rituals that were so central to classical Judaism that the, the offering of sacrifices, that the temple as a, as a way of communicating with God, of expiating sin, of receiving forgiveness with the destruction of the temple twice, and the displacement of people to another land, how are they able to maintain a sense of balance and a sense of purpose, a sense of meaning, and a sense of integrity to keep themselves on the straight and narrow and to reincorporate themselves as a nation throughout all of these phenomenal challenges to their existence? It is really mind-boggling. So as I said earlier, I'm not going to provide answers why. I may give some hints as to what I think in the next class that I'm about to record, but let us simply leave for now with the questions, with the moment to reflect, and realize that we are now moving into a new period of Jewish existence because the, the dominant population is no longer demographically centered in Israel. It is going to slowly, slowly shift to the diaspora, to places like Mesopotamia, which has a phenomenal renaissance and a, a, the period of the creation of the Talmud. Uh, also in Egypt, the Italian peninsula and so on, we'll see huge surges in Jewish population. And Jews begin to kind of rethink what it means to be Jewish outside of Israel over the course of the next few centuries. So that's what we're going to be looking at next, the medieval period, and we'll see that somehow the Jews managed with phenomenal vitality to maintain their uh, distinct existence over so many centuries despite so many challenges. Thank you very much for watching.